All right. If you would be opening your Bibles up to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 20. Uh, now, I know it's been a while since I've been here, so remember that in 2 Samuel chapter 19, uh, Absalom has died, the rebellion's been put down, but that does not end the tension between the northern tribes who had supported Absalom and basically Judah who had supported David. Um, and really throughout the rest of Israel's history, that tension's sort of, in a lot of ways, always going to kind of be there, right? When we, know, we know, of course, that it would be under David's grandson, Rehoboam, when the kingdom would split. Um, and we also are given the indication that things were not necessarily great. The relations between the north and the south were not great even during the time of Solomon uh, because of the complaining that we see from some of the northern tribes a little bit later on. Uh, when the, the kingdom does officially split. And at this point in time, David has put down the rebellion, but he doesn't necessarily have the loyalty of all the people. And as a result, that leads to further problems for David in chapter 20. And again, this all boils down to the relationship between Israel and Judah. Remember last time, I believe it was a week ago, uh, from this past Wednesday, we kind of compared at the end of chapter 19 the response of Barzillai versus the response of primarily Israel but also Judah when it came to the king being welcomed back into Jerusalem, or, or at least welcomed back into mainland Israel, when he's going to be put as the sole head of the kingdom uh, in Israel. And remember that Barzillai was the individual that when David promised him, you know, you'll get this great reward if you come and live with me, you get all the pleasantries of living with a king. Barzillai's point was ultimately that, you know, I did what was expected of me as a citizen of Israel. I don't deserve any type of special treatment. I don't deserve any type of special reward because at the end of the day, I did basically what my public service was to my country. And so, you know, David, thank you for the offer, but, you know, I, I did what I should have done. I just did the right thing. And we talked about his great example that he set in doing that and compared it with Israel and Judah, who basically get in a squabble because Israel feels like, well, we deserve greater recognition for David coming back into Israel because we were the first people to think of it. We were the first per people to agree on it. And that poor mindset of the Israelites in that situation, uh, and, and really Judah as well, perhaps, but to, more so to a greater extent, the men of Israel, that type of mindset led to further problems. And that's what's going to happen in, in chapter 20. I believe we've already gotten into that. Uh, but that tension between the men of Israel and, and the men of Judah will basically be there throughout the rest of Israel's history um, for the most part. Now in chapter 20, I believe we got down to verse 2. Remember that we are introduced to a man named Sheba who was of what tribe? He was of the tribe of Benjamin. We know, of course, that this is the same tribe as the former king Saul, who at this point has obviously passed away. And... We're not specifically told why, but more than likely the connection is based on what has happened in verse, what happened in chapter 19, verses 40 through 43. And the men of Israel, or at least the people following Sheba, which is not a large group, uh, but it was a significant group. A lot of them looked at what David did, basically showing favorability to the men of Judah in their minds, and they say, well, we don't have any future. We have no share in David, verse 2, chapter 20, verse 2. We have no share in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Our, our future prospects do not look bright under the leadership of David. And so every man to his tents, O Israel. Notice verse 2, so every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba the son of Bichri. Now this is not sort of what we might call hyperbole here. There's a lot of men of Israel that... that that desert David, but not necessarily everybody. But the men of Judah from the Jordan as far as Jerusalem remained loyal to their king. And that's what we look at now moving forward because 
David is going to have to once again put down, at least have to deal with a group of people that are trying to replace him as king. So verse 3, the text says that now David came to his house at Jerusalem. And the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in seclusion, and supported them, but did not go into them. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. Uh, now this verse here is obviously a connection back to when Absalom first took over, sort of a, a gaining, uh, for us, gaining a sense of sort of how David handled that situation. Remember that David left a certain number of women, behind to manage the house. Remember that Absalom, of course, uh, acting on the advice of Ahithophel, uh, basically went in uh, and uh, obviously slept with him, which, you know, that's something that, you know, King's son doesn't do. Um, and that's sort of the reason why, they, why we have this indication here that they were put in seclusion. David did not go into them. That's, again, because of what Absalom had, had done. Now verse 4, David said to Amasa, Assemble the men of Judah for me within three days and be present here yourself. Now, Amasa is very important because he was the general of who? Not necessarily Saul. Absalom, yeah. Abner, Abner and Amasa. Remember that Amasa had been the general under Absalom, Right? And David, as we saw in chapter 19, as a way of trying to help reunite the kingdom, his mindset was, well, we're going to replace Joab with Amasa. Uh, and we're going to put him as the head of the army, again, as a way to sort of extend a peace offering. Again, I think I mentioned the example of uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln in 1864, choosing Andrew Johnson, a southern governor in Tennessee as his running mate as a way to try to help regain the loyalty of the South once the Civil War was over. Same, same concept. So David gets a massive, obviously, to assemble the men of Judah. They're going to go to try to put down Sheba's rebellion. So verse 5, Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the set time which David had appointed him. Now, we're not necessarily told exactly why, at least, there is a delay here. And whatever the case might be, some th seem to think maybe uh, Amasa had a little bit of a harder time gaining the support of the men of Judah because he had sided with Absalom. But whatever the case may be, for some reason, he is delayed in the sense of being able to have the men ready to go and pursue. And that'll pose problems, obviously, for Amasa in this chapter. And so David then turns to Abishai, because things are not getting done very quickly. Now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. Now, perhaps, now we know in this chapter at least that this rebellion's put down pretty quickly, but at least in David's mind, who's, you know, again, coming off a large-scale rebellion that had been launched by his son, you know, David's taking every precaution here, right? Delaying per the pursuit of Sheba could allow Sheba to rally more supporters to his side, which is what Sheba is kind of doing when he is, uh, when he is on the run. And David naturally is not going, to, is not wanting to let Sheba gain momentum in, in trying to build up a much larger army. So the quicker that we can take him out, the better. And Amasa, for whatever reason, is having a hard time getting the men ready and getting them to the point where they can pursue at the same time that David wants. And that's going to pose a problem because now Abishai is given command to lead the pursuit. Now notice, of course, that Joab is not mentioned at this point. He's mentioned in verse 7. 
But this does kind of go to show to us, again, that, you know, Joab might have been the one that talked David out of his sorrow with Absalom's death, but David still hasn't forgotten that Joab was the one responsible for the death of Absalom. That relationship is, is, is severed in a lot of ways. But now that Abishai goes and pursues, the indication is, is that Joab will also go with him. And that's where we run into a problem here in chapter 20. Verse 7, So Joab's men with the Cherethites, the Pelethites, and all the mighty men went out after him. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba the son of Bichri. Remember that the Cherethites, the Pelethites, uh, reference to a group of Philistines that were supportive of David. They had been right there when David had been on the run back in chapter 15. And actually they would, David's mighty men, go out after uh, Sheba to hunt, to, to hunt him down. But this is where the problem enters in, is that Joab sees this as an opportunity to try to regain his position. Now, we know that sometimes people will do whatever it takes to get ahead in life, whether that's in their work, sort of like how Joab tries to get ahead in life in, 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 uh, with how he deals with Amasa. Uh, people try to get ahead in life, uh, perhaps not just in work, uh, but people try to get ahead in life in uh, terms of uh, the sporting world sometimes. Uh, and, and there's nothing in, in wrong with improving your standing in life, but, you know, again, how do you get there? That's kind of what's really important, right? Because sometimes people use dishonest ways of trying to get ahead in life. They take drastic means. Again, we, you know, we, we've often heard the phrase, the end justifies the means. Some people look at that as a way to say, you know, if the greater benefit for me at the end um, that benefit will outweigh whatever it takes to get there. And some people have used that to try to justify evil actions in uh, human history. And in this particular case, Joab, whereas his job is to pursue after Sheba, looks at this as a way to finally get back his position by dealing with the massa. Uh, again, Joab was a man that would do whatever it took, even if it was a dishonest evil action, to, to try to regain his, his uh, position. So, verse 8, When they were at the large stone which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them. Now Joab was dressed in battle in armor, on it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at his hips. And as he was going forward, it fell out. From my reading of this, uh, it seems like, again, this is done on, done on you know, obviously done on purpose, but uh, the sword was a little bit loose that, he was, uh, that was on his hip. And he uses that as a way to sort of gain an advantage over a massa. Because, verse 9, Joab approaches Amasa as though everything's fine. Joab said to Amasa, Are you in health, my brother? This is just a type of greeting. But it says that Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. Uh, now, this is something that's very foreign to us, but we're told in that day that you would typically, uh, especially with a superior, it was not that uncommon to greet a superior in a way that's similar to this. Uh, to take by the right hand, uh, again, this is foreign to us, but th this, was a, this was a typical greeting at the time. And a lot of times what would happen is that the person doing the greeting would often kneel down as a way of respect. And that's sort of what we gather here in our, our minds about the image of what's going on. Joab comes, he approaches Amasa, who obviously is ahead of him at this point, right, because Amasa is the head of the army. He greets him, he kneels before him, but conveniently, the sword is not fastened or it's a little bit too big and it falls off with it. And while he grabs the beard, 
verse 10, it says that Amasa did not notice that the sword was in Joab's hand. So he's kneeled down, the sword has fallen out because, you know, maybe he doesn't have it fastened properly or maybe the, the you know, if you're, it's not tight enough around his waist. But all of this is a way for him to sort of cleverly deceive Amasa to thinking that he is going to give him a, give him a warm, respectful greeting. And so as Joab's kneel, kneeling on the ground, he basically has the opportunity to grab the sword with the left hand. Notice that he struck him with it in the stomach and his entrails poured out on the ground and he did not strike him again. Thus he died. Uh, and so Joab has killed Amasa not with his right hand but with his left hand you know this might remind us of uh, the judge Ehud right who was left handed killed the king of Eglon stabbed him uh, with his left hand not, not a whole lot of people mentioned in the Bible that were specifically left handed or, or killed somebody with the left hand uh, but that's, what, that's exactly what happens here as it did in Ehud's case. He strikes him uh, in the, some translations may have below the fifth rib, but the point is, is that this is a deadly blow. Notice that he did not have to strike him again, thus he died. And then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. And the point now is, is that Joab can basically take control of the army once again. David doesn't know anything about this. David did not order this. But yet Joab looked at this opportunity as a way for him to get ahead in life, to regain his position. But again, if it required Joab to do something that was wrong, well, so be it, right? If I can regain my position, it doesn't matter that I have to kill a massa who the king has already who the king has already hand selected as the head of the army once again Joab much like he did with Absalom's death much like what he did with Abner is consistently defying the king and eventually Joab's actions will catch up with him uh, when you get into the book of first Kings but again you have an example here of an individual that will do whatever it takes to get ahead in life even if it means doing something uh, even if it means using deceit, murder, to, to get ahead in life, Joab is, is willing to do that. I don't know if I mentioned this story here, but it was in the news a couple weeks ago. Uh, there's a woman that down in Florida that uh, was basically hiding her 93-year-old dead mother in the freezer uh, because she was still trying to gain her mother's... Uh, uh, Social Security, some type of benefits. Um, and that's wild because the, the police figured out something was... Didn't feel like something was right. They investigated They found her, her dead mother in the freezer. She'd been there for two weeks. Uh, and she did that because she was trying to collect on the benefits of her deceased mother. Again, the point is some people will do whatever it takes to get ahead. Will do whatever it takes, even use deceit, to try to get ahead in life, which is what Joab has done here. Whereas, again, when you think about it in the New Testament, Paul would write that we are to live honestly among all people. Jesus, again, it was said in 1 Peter chapter 2, there was no guile, there was no deceit found in him. Remember that Jesus in John 1 verse 47 commended Nathanael because he was not a deceitful person. Joab, on the other hand, shows is an individual that we can learn what not to do. So, verse 11. Meanwhile, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, follow Joab. So, that's where, again, the end result for Joab is justified by whatever means he took. The people at this point look and say, Amasa's at the point of death. Here, the only option is to accept Joab as our leader. If you accept Joab as your leader, that is the man that will uh, lead for David. So follow Joab. And naturally, there probably was a little bit of tension here, right? Because Amasa was the head of the army of Israel. 
And you're talking, talking about the men of Judah here. Perhaps Joab knew that, that would be a, uh, this would be a perfect opportunity for him to get ahead because of prior animosity. But either way, verse 12 says that Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the men saw that all the people stood still, he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him when he saw that everyone who came upon him halted. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in that situation, but obviously this is a very gruesome sight. Whereas the text tells us that he did not have to strike him again and he died, we do know that Amasa did not die immediately. And, you know, you can sort of picture here in your mind the, the mental of, image of a man bleeding out and, uh, and, and the pain and the screaming and the crying probably that, that followed with it. Typically in my U.S. history class, um, one, I, I, sometimes I show them clips from certain movies that I think do a pretty good job of uh, accurately uh, depicting a certain event. And one of the clips that I like to show my class is during World War II uh, when we talk about D-Day and, and I, I show them the opening scene from Saving Private Ryan. Um, if you've ever seen that movie, you know that the first 20 minutes of that movie are probably the most intense moments in that movie because it shows the actual, it's a, very, it's a pretty good depiction of the D-Day uh, landing in uh, Normandy and, and the northern coast of France. And there's one particular image, that uh, one particular moment in that 20 minutes that sticks out in my mind is a picture of a man that had been shot and you can kind of see his intestines coming out. It's a very gruesome thing to watch. Um, and, you know, it's very gruesome, but typically it, it helps my kids remember, uh, connect, you know, D-Day with what's called amphibious in invasion. But th the point being is that this is a very gruesome death uh, that Amasa is going through. Perhaps a death that we've kind of seen depicted on, on movies before. So much so that, you know, they're kind of tired of looking at him, right? So they throw a, a covering or a garment over him um, because people are noticing that he's laying there dying. Uh, and it says in verse 13 that when he was removed from the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba the son of Bichri. At this point, you know, it doesn't matter about past loyalty. Joab has gotten what he wanted, and the people of Judah at this point recognize that the only way forward is under the command of Joab. Now, verse 14, we pick up with uh, Sheba. And he went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel and Beth Maek and all the Barites. So they were gathered together and also went after Sheba. Then they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Maek, and they cast up a siege mound against the city, and it stood by the rampart. And all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. So one of David's fears was that the men of that the that the men following Sheba could possibly escape. Notice it was verse. Let me go back and find it was verse. It was verse uh, verse six, right? David's concern is. Right, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. Well, that happens in verse 14 and verse 15. He does find a fortified city. And typically, again, the only way that you're going to capture the people in the city is that you would lay siege to a, a city. And what the people, what the men under Joab do is that they sort of build like a big mound. They dig up dirt. They put the dirt on the outside walls of the city as a way for soldiers to kind of cross over the wall um, and to get into the city, which is a very time-consuming thing. But again, Joab and the men are going to bulldoze the city down, we might could say, if that's what it takes to get Sheba. But in verse 16, we're introduced to a wise woman, much like the woman from Decoa back in chapter 14 that's actually going to probably save a lot of people's lives because of her actions. Verse 16, a wise woman cried out from the city 
Hear, hear, or listen. Please say to Joab, Come nearby that I may speak with you. When he had come near to her, the woman said, Are you Joab? He answered, I am. Then she said to him, Hear the words of your maidservant. And he answered, I am listening. So she spoke, saying, They used to talk in former times, saying, They shall surely seek guidance at Abel. And so they would end disputes. I am among the peaceful peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? Now she's a wise woman because again of what and who she will save as a result of her words. And her point overall is that this city, which uh, I believe... I think it's in First Chronicles, this city is perhaps in the tribe of Naphtali, that this was a city where people would often come to talk things out. Uh, notice that the text says that they would uh, end disputes in this city. They would seek guidance at Abel and they would end disputes. This was a city where disagreements were put to an end, where things did not get out of control. And in this case, the woman is going to help this from becoming a more violent situation than what it will be. Because she points out in verse 19 that she is among the peaceful, peaceable and faithful in Israel. In other words, she is a supporter of David. While Sheba has sort of got himself holed up in the city trying to protect himself, not everybody agrees with Sheba. And her point is very clear. You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? Remember that in the book of Joshua, God gave the land to the Israelites for them to, and, and in order to do that, they had to drive out the Canaanites. But the idea scenario is they would not have to kill one another to maintain control over their cities. That's not how God wanted that to be handled and that is really what her ultimate point is. Joab, in your rage, you are on the verge of destroying a city that is just as much a part of the inheritance of the Lord as the same tribe where you came from. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? You know, that is... That is, that is, that is something for us as Christians to keep in mind when it comes to our relationship with those in the church. Her point is, right, I'm, I'm peaceful and peaceable and faithful. You know, I'm a, I am of the same inheritance as you, right? We are the children of God. Within the church, we get upset and angry with one another at time, with one another uh, at, at times. And it's very easy for us to let our anger motivate us to say things that are detrimental or do things that are detrimental to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And much like the wise woman here, we have to think to ourselves that, you know, whereas we get angry sometimes at, at our fellow Christians, we're of the same inheritance, right? If our words or our actions are of the mindset where we're trying to sort of destroy or really to undermine you know the confidence of other Christians then those words or those actions are things that we don't need to do because we are of the same inheritance why would you why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord as this woman is saying here it doesn't do you any benefit it doesn't do us any benefit to hurt our fellow Christians because we are of the same inheritance. So verse 20, Joab listens and says, Far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. That is not so. But a man from the mountains of Ephraim, uh, Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, has raised his hand against the king, against David. Deliver him only and I will depart from the city. And so, again, the wisdom of the woman. The woman said to Joab, Watch, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman in her wisdom went to all the people, and they cut off the hand of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it out to Joab. Then he blew a trumpet, and they withdrew from the city, every man to his tent. 
So Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. Now this is also a very good point that we can draw application from. You know, Joab's point was, you know, whereas, you know, you are of the same inheritance, there's still a problem here that has to be addressed, right? Sheba has openly rebelled against the king. Something's got to be done about him. And rather than to make excuses for Sheba, the woman says, you know, you're right. We got to do something about it. So they go and they have Sheba killed. Again, a very gruesome thing, throwing the head over the wall. Uh, but when you think about with our relationship with, with, with when you think about our relationship as Christians, sometimes in order to mend those relationships, when a Christian gets angry at another Christian, sometimes that anger is justified because there is a specific problem there that hasn't been addressed. And as Christians, we have to recognize that in order to have unity with one another and unity with other congregations, Again, we have to be willing to get rid of the problems that cause disorganization, the problems that prevent unity. And that's what the woman does here, right? Whereas we're of the same inheritance, the woman recognizes that we cannot be unified if this problem still exists or we allow this problem to tolerate. Much like the same thing for us as Christians, when we get upset with our fellow Christians, there may be a justifiable reason. And if somebody is upset with me because I've done something wrong, then the only way that I can mend that relationship is getting that problem out, fixing the problem, which is what this woman does here, which is something that we as Christians have to do when we have problems with our fellow brothers and sisters. We have to examine ourselves, and if we are in the wrong, we need to get rid of the sin or get rid of the problem, which is what the woman does here. And as the text just indicates to us, again, Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. More people did not have to die. Now, I'll just, verses 23 through 26 are just sort of a, a summation of the leadership under David's government. But there is something that I will point out specifically. It says that Joab was over all the army of Israel, right? He regained his position, used unjustified ways to get there. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. Notice that Adoram was in charge of revenue. Uh, Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahalad, was recorder. Sheba was scribe. Zadok and Abiath were, were priests. And Ira, the Jairite, was a chief minister under David. The thing that I'll point out here is verse 24, that Adoram was in charge of revenue. Now, at, the, at this point in time, this doesn't seem like a whole lot. But we do know that later on, that part of the problems between Israel and Judah are going to develop because of things like harsh forced labor and because of taxation. And those problems are going to start to creep up at the end of David's reign and really into the reign of Solomon. And it goes to show to us that while as Sheba's rebellion is put down, the perfect harmony between Israel and, and, and Judah uh, will not last forever. Uh, and, and that's a little bit of foreshadowing for things that are, that are about to happen. With that being said, are there any comments on what we've talked about in chapter 20 before we close? Go ahead, Brother George. One thing I get out of this is we go back to Matthew chapter 18 where it tells us as Christians how to deal with the problem with a fellow Christian. Do it in a manner where it doesn't involve other members of the congregation. Right. You go and work that out without getting a lot of support from other people ahead of you. Right. It tells you how to do it to keep unity and peace. Get Absolutely. The problem cleared up. Yes. Do it in the right way. Absolutely. Yeah, how you handle problems is very important, keeping that problem from getting out of control. I was just going to say, there, you know, you hear all the time the world is crazy. There's just, you know, it's worse now than ever. Well, obviously, they're not reading these Bible stories because, I mean, that all started back in Genesis, the first sin. And it's yeah. just, I mean, it's been this way. We just live in it. Yeah. So, well, it's like Brother Wayne said in his prayer a minute ago, right? People don't really change. At least 
human nature doesn't really change. You know, Joab in this passage was doing what what was doing whatever evil means it took to get ahead in life. People do the exact same thing today. That's a good point. If there are no other comments, we'll go ahead and stop here. We'll pick up in chapter 21 uh, next Sunday. But again, thank you for your time and thank you for your attention this morning.